Good afternoon, and we are now into the next session. I have the pleasure to invite the plenary session moderator, Mary Muyea, President of SI Future African Federation, to moderate this session titled Gender Equality for Water and Food Security. Ladies and gentlemen, as mentioned earlier, we will accept questions through the convention app and question cards. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your elaborate uh, introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. Best sisters in conference, good afternoon. All right, welcome to this afternoon session. We've had a very wonderful opening ceremony, which was full of pomp and color. I think we had a, a very good honor to have Her Majesty uh, grace the occasion. Soon after, we had a very good uh, keynote speaker who set the pace for us and tried to get our minds into why we are so optimists, why we want to stand up for women. We've had also an opportunity to take a break and have lunch. So we've fueled ourselves. We're full of energy now, yeah? So we are ready now to engage the first gear. Is that so? The first gear for us is to get knowledge, to get inspired, to get uh, given new insights into the work that we do, and so then we can develop ways of going to do it even better. So I have the privilege and honor to host this session and with these great speakers in front of you. And the topic of the afternoon is gender equality, water, and food security. Those are topics that are very close to every human being, but more so to women and girls. We know that water issues affect women and girls majorly in a very different way. When it comes to food security, without water, we cannot talk about food security. But here we are talking about equality, gender equality. So then how are we going to tie these three and make sure that whatever we do in gender equality, we have food security, matters addressed, and we also have water issues addressed for women and girls globally. I am not an expert in this at all. My work is very easy and cut out. I'm simply here to host the experts, people that have experience in these three topics, and they've done a lot of work in their uh, professional lives. Uh, we are honored to have our keynote speaker, Kusum Athukorara, who is with us and... Um, she is not just a person, because in her academic uh, life, she's done so much. I cannot even um, try to summarize that, but I will attempt, all right? Kusum is the chair for NetWater Sri Lanka and Sri Lanka Water Partnership. She is internationally recognized for her work in the water resource policies and also the rural development integrated uh, water management. Of course, these are matters that do with gender and water. She has had a lot of contributions when it comes to uh, water matters. She was honored in 2012 to, with the, by Women in Water uh, Award. So she's, she, has, she has an award in 2012. She also has been honored again with another award, Zonta Women of Achievement for Environment in 2014. However, she says that uh, she never started with Water Matters. She's been in academia for over tw 12 years. So her experience is not only academic, but practical. How has she interacted with the water issues, the water resources? And how will that help us to connect to food security and gender equality? So I will stop there and let uh, Kusum take our session. Welcome and put a big applause for, for our keynote speaker. Thank you very much, ladies. Good afternoon. Ayuboan, Wanaka, and everything else in your languages. You know, I'm coming here before you. I don't know whether I am Eliza Doolittle at the Ascot, or am I like the Dowager Duchess at Downton Abbey. But I am sorry for tottering around. I'll try to make this as interesting as a one-legged person can manage. I have one good leg. But I'd like you to remember two things, two words, integration and common sense. 
because I think those are going to be what I'm going to be talking about. As my uh, the chair said, I worked at the university, but what she didn't say is when I started teaching university, I didn't teach water. I was teaching languages and, liter and literature. And how I came from there to here is a long story, but I did make this transition so that my postgraduate was on managing rural change. For me, again, that is another important word, change. Change management is important for us, especially in view of climate change, where every one of us, whether we like it or not, is going to be forced to change. My uh, work in the university, which had to do with books and literature, prepared me for my work in my other life as a consultant, researcher, and activist. Because what I did on books, I saw again in my real life. When I did water sharing studies, I was reminded of Ignacio Siloni's Pontamara. When I talked about water pollution, I remembered Ibsen's enemy of the people. When I was talking about people migrating poverty and drought, I'm reminded of Kamala Markandaya. So the world of books is only a preparation for my real life. And I think that for me, it is really important that we go and uh, not only talk about what we do, but we also write. And that is something which is, I'm rather bad about. But this gender, water, and food security. I've always been, uh, I've always been supported, uh, energized by this slide, this theme. You know, we are an old country. We have a 2,500 year written history. And this is the mantra by which all Sri Lankan water management was guided. Let not even a drop of water obtained from rain flow to the sea without benefiting for mankind. And if you come to Sri Lanka, you will find that it, the old Sri Lanka is a wonderful network of water management. Very common sense. Very, very, you know, practical. But uh, whether we have been able to <laughs> keep it going is another issue for us. But because we went into the old co the colonial structures where we bifurcated and divided water, water for drinking, water for irrigation, water for wetlands, and not understanding this, this is one finite whole. So we think that you know we can plan and for water in its different little boxes. That's not going to help us very much, and more and more in my country, as in this country, now I'm taking this piece of paper from the paper yesterday, water cuts at clinic due to low pressure. And another one is writing, it's water cuts make us look like third world. Every one of our countries is having water cuts, water, water shortages. If we uh, look at Cape Town, going from day zero, going to day zero, maybe not quite there. And we look at Chennai, which is going towards day zero, or some a town in my country which almost went to day zero. We had only two days water in, left in Mavanella. This is something that we need to talk about. So it's not only gender, water, and food security. It's also how we manage water and how we are ready for the, 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 the issues and the problems which are going to assail us. I like Hippocrates because he always says, you know, desperate measures call for desperate solutions. And friends, we are all looking towards desperate solutions because we are having this crisis coming on us. But I also like this Lady from Sweden. Are there any ladies from Sweden? Oh. You have a wonderful representative. She's been so inspirational for people beyond, beyond your, uh, uh, your shows. This is a young woman who has been speaking openly. She's taken, she has taken all of us with her. She has taken inspired young people 
talking about the crisis is now. And ladies and gentlemen, the crisis is now. And the other issue which struck me when I read the Cambridge Climate Lectures, the winner was uh, Shigose Ude. I don't know whether he's from Nigeria. I think he's from Nigeria. And he's writing about the issues which are coming with climate change, where the Fulani um, uh, uh, herdsmen are fighting with the Dogon tribesmen. The herdsmen want have to move down to the south because their grazing grounds are now no longer existing. The, uh, naturally, people are resisting, and the resistance leads to a lot of violence. I think he wrote in this article that 1,000 people had been shot. So this is just one instant where stressors caused by climate change and water insecurity is pushing us into other kinds of stressors. We have migrations caused by climate change. We have uh, stressors within countries, fights between people because of climate change. And all this water insecurity is really affecting the women whom I like to call the foot soldiers of climate change, never the generals the foot soldiers, the, one, the people who do all the grunt work. When we look at climate change, you know, very often we are thinking, oh, floods, you know, people are getting flooded out. You know, this is, uh, this is the poster boy of the Sri Lankan police. You know, he's uh, doing his um, uh, traffic police job in the flood. And this other lady thought that the floods is a wonderful opportunity to put, take a selfie and put it on Facebook. So, you know, this gives, floods gives opportunities as well as tragedies to lots of people. But uh, do we look at what comes behind it for food security? We have crop losses. We have rising prices of essential commodities. We have loss of family savings. People are being, I mean, they are being, I think they're just made indigent by family savings. Resultant, you have migration to the cities. You have the escalation of urban issues because of the amount of people who are coming to the cities looking, at, looking for jobs. Now, all these are not media friendly. These are the silent tragedies which happen over and over again but it never comes in the first, you know, it's very rarely that we would see it in a newspaper. Like, yes, I've had suicides of Indian fam uh, farmers, I've been tracking that, but other than that, I really can't see very much. So, drought and famine. Drought is a silent killer, and it is a very difficult uh, uh, issue for us to tackle because it happens so slowly. So how, what do we do and what does it affect, what do we do to mobilize people to take action on this very slow moving silent disaster? And especially how does it affect women? Women very often are left in the villages to manage families, to manage old people, to manage uh, farmlands which no longer can be managed because they are unmanageable, while men migrate out that causes an entire set of new problems for women, especially because, you know, they, uh, they are very often in uh, communities, they are the ones who have the least amount of awareness of techno agrarian technologies, they are the ones who have the least amount of connection with agencies which can give them the seed, the pesticides, the weedicides that they need. They are suddenly abandoned, and they are sitting there waiting, looking for the remittance to come. So. What do we do? How do we recognize the drought? How do we recognize the results of a drought and plan towards it? The narrative of the drought for me is the narrative of the migration which we see every day on TV. That is very media savvy. But do we ever look back and say, what made these people leave their countries? What kind of situation did they encounter that they were forced to go? This is not what we are talking about. That is the problem of food security. And as we go from disaster to disaster, I would like you to remember this. This is for me a common sense solution. If we 
prepare for a drought or a, any kind of disaster beforehand, the, we are going to save a lot of money. But unfortunately, we look at only disaster, sorry, only disaster, uh, only the disaster, the costs of disaster, looking after people, but we do not look at how to prevent it. Ladies and gentlemen, this is what our decision makers do. You know, this is, a, this is the cartoon which I like very much. All the promises which we are made, all the promises that we are given before the election does not happen after the disaster. So, uh, how, but if I go back to the year 2000 where we had the World Water Forum in The Hague, one of the critical decisions taken in The Hague was accessing political decision makers. Along the way, it pops up and it falls out again of the equation. But it is so important for us, all of us as voters, to ensure that our elected representatives continue to keep the, their eye on the ball. And that is something which is not happening in many countries. It certainly is not happening in my country to the extent that I would like to. But if we can convince decision makers that food security is not only going to be handled by the Department of Food, it is also going to be done by so many other organizations which look after catchments, which look after water quality, which look after health, you know, all the bundling the SDGs in one. I think this is something which, is, which I would like to see happen. Yeah, I'm going to run through this very uh, quickly because we had a pilot project which uh, I'm sure you get all the slides uh, later on, where we started working on climate smart agriculture, giving, uh, working with a private sector entity, which is very rare. Normally, private sector doesn't go into agriculture. I'll come to that later. Where we tried to work with women farmers, giving them the exposure, the technical know-how for getting production of essential food as well as uh, high-value crops. And uh, in, we gave micro heart level training in uh, rainwater management. We gave the cultivation for high value crops. But uh, we hit three projects, three disasters. We had a huge drought. Then we had an enormous flood which washed out everything. And then we had a normal, uh, a normal uh, year. So what happens is that we realize that we need to have a lot of, if you're working with women, they need a lot more support than is usually given by a department. They need mentoring, constant mentoring, because they are really trying to do two jobs at the same time. They're trying to look after families as well as their little plots of land, which would give them a lot of money if they do it the proper way. The, the second is that when you uh, invest, and you have a disaster, the poorer households simply cannot afford a second investment. So they are cleaned out. And then we don't have uh, uh, the age-old traditions in our country where we had, you know, labor sharing, uh, call up thumb. All that is gone because people have moved out. So we don't have, we have labor problems. Again, where do we find labor to, for this kind of activity? We don't have formally recognized, re registered organizations. So the women, when they go with a problem, have no one to go to, they have no standard, they have no status. Uh, and finally, uh, there is no voice for women, and this is what you are talking about, a voice for women at the, uh, the decision-making tables. I would like to talk with pri about private sector engagement because we know we have someone from the private sector following on from me. I find that a lot of private sector engagement tends to be like this calendar on the SDGs, on advocacy, on brochures, awareness, or this little bottle, which is a clay bottle, uh, which is made for you know storing water. Now, I find that uh, the private sector does not engage as much on agriculture and food security because those are long-term um, activities and very often uh, they would prefer to go for something, okay, building toilets or building rainwater harvesting systems because that's more, I mean, you can finish it fairly quickly. But uh, private sector engagement is, we all agree, is important if we are to have some need uh, some way of promoting the SDGs. 
I like to take this picture of a market woman because it is not just a market woman sitting and cutting vegetables. It, to me, it has, there's a drain behind, so there's the SDGs on health. There is the, she's very, I mean, you can look at her, she's very thin, so her health issues are there. Then you have also probably the way that uh, she has no housing because this is a slum area. So for me, this picture brings together everything that we and you, Soroptimis, are working on. This is your target market, so as to say, and this is what you have been uh, doing so well when I read your, your uh, activities. But there is one more uh, group. We are talking about leave no one behind. I did a program, the first program that I did for the differently abled, hearing disabled children. So the entire program was done in sign language. If I can have the video, please. It was the most silent program I'd ever done. Now, what would happen if you, are, if, if you can't hear and you don't hear the notice on the radio saying, evacuate, the floods are coming? What would happen if you can't hear and you watch TV and there is nobody doing the presentation in sign language? I mean, I'm, not, I'm just looking at this, but there are other issues which will affect the people who cannot see, uh, you know, the, all those people whom we are leaving behind. And we need to have something which looks at these special people's special needs. Boots on the ground. Ladies, you had one uh, very effective lady with, on the wheelchair, Anusha, over here. Over here. And I am going to flash my leg. <laughs> so, the, the two of us have been working on this for the last two weeks, not wondering, oh, well, okay, we know we are going to go there, but then we, know, we don't know whether we can stand up. Now, what I need to do with this boots on the ground is, as you ladies from the Soroptimis go to the communities that you are working on, remember there are people like us who will have issues. But you also need to remember that, to me, if you are here, you are one of the elite. You are, I mean, you may not be part of the crazy risk, risk Asians film, but you are the elite. So how do you communicate and how do you work with people? How do you identify your projects? I found that if you do not give enough interaction time and enough energy to communicate and really understand what, your com what this community needs, we may go often with the solution that we think is necessary, but may not be exactly on the world. So before you start a project, I would really want you, with all your commitment, with all your common sense, and all your sense of integration, it's not only something on food security. It is not only giving toilets. It is not only doing a program for uh, children who have been abused. Please try and look at the big picture. Go for it from the wide angle lens, uh, lens because that is what is needed and that is what I see in my years of development work, what is missing. Because very often we are boxed in our own silos and we have to get out of that silo. So. I think that uh, that's all that I would like to do, but uh, I'm uh, reminded of, uh, you know, you know I, there's this song by Frank Sinatra, you know, which says, I did it my way. So I think that all of you are doing it wonderfully well, the Soroptimist way. Thank you very much. Thank you. A big applause for our speaker. Thank you, Kusum. You take us down memory lane to see the interaction with the communities and what is happening with Water Matters and how they connect with the work that we do as optimists. You give us a challenge to integrate and also to think about prevention, right? So I will have the audience thinking about what the keynote speaker has, uh, has put forward. 
and then invite the next speaker, who is Marit, uh, our SI president. And Marit is known not only to being a sort of optimist, but she's known very much in the water world. She is the president for Women for Water Partnership International, and she owns a private company on translation, Backlet International. So Marit has many hearts, but at the moment, I think she's going to take us through the facts, through what is out there, and how it affects the work that we do, and how we can uh, collect our strategies better from our uh, experience. Marit, it's your time. Thank you very much. And there's my presentation. Um, so I speak today as, uh, with my two hats on. Women for Water Partnership is uh, also my baby. I'm the president, and uh, we've got 28 uh, or, uh, organizational members. One of them is the Soroptimus International, and one is the Soroptimus International of Europe. And uh, to me, the significance and importance of um, this topic, gender equality for water and food security, cannot be underestimated. And I think you heard that from Kusum as well. As many of you might know, my passion for both topics, water security and gender equality, has spent much of my Soroptimist work and raising awareness of the interconnection between the two subjects. And it's a priority that I have really committed myself to. The world faces a number of critical global challenges, not least the debilitating effects of climate change, resonating with many of us and channeling much of the work we do, due in part to the disproportionate impact the fallout has on women and girls. It is well documented that climate change impacts women differently and more deeply than men, exposed to increased risks due to their primary role in care work and agricultural production. A catalogue of threats facing the world is prepared by the World Economic Forum, accentuating the enormity of the risk of both climate change and water, with the water crisis making the top five. Today, a water-food-energy nexus sits at the heart of sustainable development, driving by the effects, driven by the effects of climate change and expanding an increasingly mobile population, rapid urbanization, changing diets, and economic growth. As also stated in this global risk report, environmental risks are growing in prominence both in terms of likelihood and impact over a 10-year horizon. In 2017 only, we were confronted with hurricanes, extreme temperatures and heavy, heavy, heavy rains. Agricultural systems are stressed, not only because of climate change, also because of the population growth. Water systems are not evenly distributed and equally accessible. Rural women and girls, particularly in developing countries, are the most water insecure, disproportionately uh, responsible for fetching water for domestic users and for irrigation. They often lack access to affordable and appropriate water infrastructure and climate change increases the burden of water and food collection and the burden of the long-term impact of loss of land, livelihood and security. And that, ladies and gentlemen, has to change. If we look for a moment at the changes of the world is facing in the respect to water and food security, in 2017, 821 million people were said to be undernourished and 151 million children under five suffered from stunt growth. A lack of access to nutritious food leads to malnutrition and childhood disease. 
And it is often women and children, the elderly, people living with disabilities, and those living in rural locations who face the highest levels of vulnerability. Another thing is coexisting with this undernourished nutrition. Global obesity levels reached to 672 million, nearly tripling since 1975, with obesity in general affecting more women than men. Then you get changing rainfall patterns, drought, floods, disrupt the availability, quality, and the consistency of food security. And as many as 2.5 billion smallholder farmers, with women often the mainstay, are said to be vulnerable to the effects of climate change, with the disruptions created, creating both shortages and price spikes. So according to the UN Water SDG Synthesis Report of 2018, 30% of the world's population does not have access to safely managed water services at home. And 60% of that population worldwide does not have uh, adequate sanitation. The need is greatest in Africa. We know that. More than 4 billion people live in countries that suffer more water scarcity uh, at least one month per year, resulting in serious food shortage. Women in sub saharan Africa walk some 16 million hours per day. This was research last year. Worldwide, women and girls spend an estimated 152 to 200 million hours a day collecting water. This was the research from the Asian Development Bank. Hours which cannot be spent on more productive and other activities, such as education, which is so important to be independent and equal, such as income generation. So, how does gender equality and the empowerment of women, SDG 5, intersect within the water and food security system? And why is equality now so important? Clearly, the 17 UN SDGs are indivisible. And, as we know, the effect of one often affects all the others. Furthermore, achieving SDG 5 and creating opportunities for the full participation of women is now commonly understood to be crucial to meeting up, to meeting each of the 17th SDGs, plus all their targets. Agriculture is the single largest employment source, and in sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia, 60 to 70 percent of women work in agriculture, often informal, seasonal, dangerous, and devalued. Women are crucial in translating agricultural production into food and nutrition security, and this includes livestock crops, fisheries, agroforestry, wild harvesting of foods, and the work they are doing is, again, often invisible. Women have less access and control over land, natural and productive resources and services, imposing costs on society. The FAO said that if women had equal access to productive resources as men, they could increase the yields of their farm by 20 to 30 percent, raising total agricultural output in developing countries by 2.5 to 4 percent per annum, reducing hunger by 12 to 17 percent. And women are increasingly uh, positioned as heads of households responsible for food security both at household level and within the communities and make up 43% of agricultural labor in developing countries, producing again 60 to 80% of the food. And yet, as food producers and providers, they are still often dismissed. A lack of sex-desegregated data 
limits planning, meaning women's needs are unreflected in policy making, lessening full participation, increasing workload, and limiting long term sustainability of their efforts to deliver food security. Inequalities, often deep rooted stereotyping, lack of female role models, and so often called engineering cultures prevent women from having careers in water and as such are greatly underrepresented in water governance fora. These are all things we as optimists could help with. Women have tangible knowledge of water management and food security uh, and there must be a change in mindset. Women as agents of change rather than as victims or only beneficiaries. This is what Kusum said as well. We must use our voices to combine the implementation of SDG 5 and 6 in national action plans and influence policymakers and those who hold the purse uh, strings And as it stands, there is little hor um, horizontal coordination between the two. I'm getting out of my, uh, I'm having, uh, I'm taking too much time. So what I would really like to say is involve women in the designing, in the budgeting, in the implementation, the monitoring, the evaluating of programs, of food security, water and sustainable development. It requires empowerment, capacity development, vocational training and finances to reach the women directly. Around the world, resilient and resourceful women contribute in a multitude of ways through different livelihood strategies to lift their families and communities out of poverty and face the many global challenges, including climate change. It is never a single action to change the situation and it's never only about technical solutions. A more holistic approach is needed in order to face uncertainties, in, particularly, in particular droughts, floods and storms and the impact on security of food and water. Women's economic empowerment is interconnected with their social and political empowerment through their increased respect status and self-confidence and increased decision-making power in household, communities and institutions. I thank you and I assume that you know what we still have to do. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. A big applause for President Mariette. Thank you for that uh, hard statistics. Numbers don't lie. You put the problem out there for us to see and what we can do and how it affects women and food security issues. Allow me to get onto stage Dr. Rajiv, who is our next speaker. He is the founder of the Venuscape Management Company and he is currently uh, the director for Water uh, Global Technology, the Water Global Company that does, uh, deals with purification of water systems. So, Dr. Rajiv, you will take us through these uh, great systems and see how it can help us to tackle the problems that have already been highlighted by the previous speakers. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, a very good afternoon, ladies, um, and the two or three gentlemen that are towards the back of the hall. Um, you know, one of the things that we do every single day is what I'm going to do right now. You know, we drink clean, well-filtered, treated water on a daily basis. But this is something that you know, is somewhat a privilege in the world that we live in today. And it's a privilege that over 2 billion people on this planet, about 35% of the world's population does not have. To put that to perspective, in a hall like this, where we've got, say, 1,000 people, over 300 of you would be forced to drink dirty, filthy, and very diseased water like this on a daily basis. Or you would be forced to go thirsty. 
Now, this is the reality of our world, and it's a very cruel irony. Just take a look at our planet Earth, the blue planet. Over 70% of Earth is covered in water. We've got seven seas, 165 major rivers, 300 million lakes, all containing over 300 million trillion litres of water. Wow, that's a lot of water. Despite this, every single day, men, women and children are literally dying of thirst. Try to understand what I'm saying. We are dying of thirst in a world that's filled with water. I would like all of you in the hall to just close your eyes for a short moment, if that's possible. Imagine you're a mother of four young, beautiful girls. You live in a remote village, deep in the interior. Every other week, your daughters, your husband, or your neighbor is falling sick. Less than a year ago, your young eight-year-old daughter died in your arms, and she died due to dehydration that was caused by severe diarrhea. To get to the closest medical facility, it would take you five days to walk by foot. Now, what is causing all of this suffering? Could it be the water that's being used in your village? The water in your village does not come by easy. It is anything but clean. It is flavoured with feces, with contamination and dirt. But you have no choice, so you boil this water, you feed it to your family, and you hope for the best. Ladies and gentlemen, if I may ask you to open your eyes, you'll realise that this is no figment of imagination, but this is reality. Now, this year is Faduma. Faduma is this eight-year-old girl that I was talking about, and she's no longer with us. Faduma is not alone in her struggles. This image here is happening in all over different parts of the world, and every single time I look at an image like this, it genuinely does break my heart into a million pieces. Faduma's case is not some isolated freak occurrence. Now, far from it, in over 64 countries, one in two people do not have any access to clean water. This humanitarian crisis, this tragic occurrence, does not discriminate between male, female, black, white, young or old. It affects people's life at every level. In more than half, in developing countries, more than half of primary schools don't have any access to water and sanitation. And without toilets, many of these girls drop out of school as soon as puberty hits them. And we all know when you deny a young girl an education, the young girl, her family, society, and a country at whole suffers. I've got another very sad fact for you. Nine seconds. Every nine seconds, an innocent life is lost due to water and sanitation-related issues. This means that every single day, 10,000 innocent lives are lost. And over the course of a year, 3.5 million human beings on this planet die due to water-related issues. I want to put that to perspective. That would mean that every single year, we are witnessing 1,000 such events like what we saw uh, on the 11th of September, year 2000, in New York City. 
Now, ladies and gentlemen, what if we actually could change this? What if we could reduce those 3.5 million lives that are lost to zero? What if with every flood or natural disaster that occurs, we do not need to spend billions of dollars getting bottled water delivered to the ant victims? What if we could save the life of every single Faduma on this planet? You have less than a minute to go, Dr. Rajiv. I know what, I know what you're thinking, you know, you know. You think that this is probably a very tall order. But what if I were to tell you that right here in this room, there is a solution for water poverty? What if I were to say to you that converting filthy water like you saw can be converted into sterile, safe drinking water simply by turning a tap, or in the case of this bottle, giving it a tiny little squeeze. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, over the past few years, this is what we at H2Go have been doing. Using cutting-edge British nanotechnology, we confirm and we transform contaminated water into safe drinking water without using any chemical additives or electricity at a production cost of less than half a cent per litre. We've been to the most interior, inaccessible parts of the world where mainstream infrastructure like electricity simply does not exist. Today, we've reached out to over 2 million people worldwide. Now, while that might sound like a large number, there are still 650 million people that don't have any access to clean water. That means we've not hit barely 0.2% of those that are in need, and our journey has barely begun. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the smile that should be on the face of every child. There are people all over the world that go without clean water. We've worked with governments, NGOs, corporations and private entities. This justice is a responsibility that is yours, mine, and something that collectively has to be worked on. I'm going to end this session by saying that this is all we have. This is our home. Carl Sagan, an astronomer who inspires me, said, the earth is the only world known so far to harbour life. There is nowhere else, at least in the near future, to which our species could migrate. Like it or not, for the moment, the earth is where we make our stand. So, let's make a stand. Thank you. Big applause for Dr. Rajiv. Thank you, thank you so much. Isn't that amazing? Changing dirty water to drinkable water instantly. Technology is what we need at the moment. Now, I move on to our next speaker, uh, Renuka Indranaja, who is the tr as, uh, a trustee of the Spark Foundation. And the Spark Foundation works in engaging communities for river wa and water conservation. So I think now you're going to be talking to the ruler of us, who are very many out there who want to know what will happen with our rivers there. The, the word water means working actively through education rehabilitation. So you also have an aspect of education re rehabilitation. Please take us through your experience and let us see what we can borrow and take home to our Soroptimist work out there. Welcome, Renuka. A big applause for her. Thank you very much, Mary, for the introduction. I must say it's an honor and privilege to be in a room full of so many beautiful women. Beautiful not just in your lovely outfits today, the vibrancy and color, but the stories I've heard about your beautiful hearts and the work which you do. So feeling very inspired and thank you for the opportunity to share our work with you.
So a little bit about uh, Spark Foundation. We are set up by Heineken Malaysia. We are the CSR arm of Heineken Malaysia. Heineken is um, the world's most international brewer, present in 192 countries. I'm not sure if we can keep up with the Seromptimis in terms of your presence worldwide. Yeah. So we have a brewery in Malaysia with 13 offices nationwide. Uh, we contribute to the government's taxes, more than a billion per annum. And we employ 36,000 people directly and indirectly. We believe in diversity and inclusion. When I first started with the company more than 15 years ago, there were 20% women in the workforce. Today, almost 50% of senior management is made up of women, and 43% of our board of directors are female. I must share with you that our head of brewing and our production director are both female. These are jobs traditionally held by men, so very proud that in Malaysia they're held by two very competent women. So why do we venture into working with water? Obviously, as Rajiv highlighted, it's so essential to our life and well-being. But for us at Heineken Malaysia, we felt that water resource protection was the right thing to do, not just for the sustainability of our business in the long term, but for the well-being of the local communities around us. So, when we look at water, the many different aspects, water efficiency, our entire production cycle, we've worked over the last four years to reduce our water consumption and successfully brought that down by 12%. All of the water that's used at our brewery is treated, 100% of it is treated before it's released back to the source. Over the years, we've invested more than $10 million for water balancing projects and river rehabilitation projects. Yeah. We'll highlight a little bit about the work we've done in East Malaysia, where we've built rainwater harvesting systems and water gravity systems and work continuously with the communities there to empower them, to educate them, and we continue to keep an eye on what's happening in those local communities. So it all starts understanding the amount of water which your products use. So being a beer company, yes, we are water intense. The product is made largely of water. So one glass of beer takes 74 liters of water to produce. But did you know that your favorite pair of jeans probably took 10,000 liters of water? So I personally have cut down on my annual jeans purchases. Um, but really, it's understanding how much water is used by these products and making those little changes to your lifestyle. So when we started our project back in 2007, we picked the river which ran just behind our business premise. Uh, absolutely dead. Nothing could survive in it. And after a few years, we converted that river and reintroduced fish. We then moved on uh, to Pera, which is another state in Malaysia, and educated communities around, the neighboring communities around the rivers there. We empowered them how to go out, check the water quality of their rivers to be the eyes for government, alert them if there's pollution in the river, and we gave them tools to educate the children as well. Phase three of our program, we've gone into a water stewardship agenda where we have looked at the protection of water sources in Malaysia. So in summary, we are now adopted six rivers and we're engaging with 144 local communities. So this is our little river in our backyard. Um, I used to dread, in 2007, I used to dread going to work on a rainy day because the first thing I would receive would be a phone call from my boss saying, Renuka, why is the river pink today? My boss is British and he had a very good sense of humor. The river was pink because all the plastic bags from upstream would wash into the river and you could barely see the water. So it took years of engaging government, bringing the various government stakeholders together there are more than a dozen local authorities and government agencies taking care of one river. We had to bring them together, took a year and a half of talking to them, bring local communities together as well, 
and empower them to make them understand that the rivers are really the source of your drinking water. These are communities who used to throw their rubbish readily into the river. Okay, lots of things we did from setting up uh, river care centers where the young children could go in and read books about environment and taking care of their rivers. We produced a handbook to educate government agencies. We held National River Forum, bringing together speakers from all over the world. Established community gardens for the local community. And as I mentioned earlier, taught them about river monitoring. Yeah? So we empowered women to help spread the message of conservation. Um, future educators from teachers training colleges. A number of them have attended our river ranger training programs. We've taught women in the local community to convert some of the rubbish removed from the river into art. And these are actually sold at some of our events. Okay. And lastly, what we've done is we've introduced water timber technology. And we've seen a lot of the local communities getting very excited about a very cheap technology which can quickly reduce your water consumption significantly. Just sharing with you very quickly, um, we also believe in the importance of education. In 2007, we also launched on an educational enrichment program. We found that a lot of Malaysian students were leaving school because they could not cope with the English language. So we ran this program to develop the skill sets of educators in seven states across Malaysia. Today, we've reached out to more than 580 teachers, and you'll be proud to note that 78% of the educators are women. With this small initiative, we've managed to impact more than 8,000 students, seeing a 20% improvement in language proficiency. Before I move on, um, I'm going to show you a video next about the work we do in East Malaysia. Yeah, this is a little bit about reaching out to communities and making a sustainable difference. Water is one of the most precious resources on earth. However, the risk of water scarcity remains a key concern in many parts of the world. Over the last 10 years, Spark Foundation, the CSR arm of Heineken Malaysia, has been growing with communities in the areas of water conservation and education programs nationwide. In 2017, we partnered with Kupi Kupi FM, a local radio station in Sabah to create alternative water supply solutions for the local communities. We built three rainwater harvesting systems at community centres in Kudat, Penampang and Baham. We installed the gutter, which is near the roof. And after that, through the gutter, we'll install a uh, PVC pipe that can channel the water to the tanks. Prior to channeling the water to the villages, to each house, we need to filter it up so that it will be safer to drink. These rainwater harvesting systems currently supply 400,000 litres of consumable water annually, benefiting more than 2,300 people of Sabah. We saw the life-changing benefits it brought to the local communities. So this year, we built more rainwater systems in Kota Belud and Keningau, in addition to building a water gravity system at Kampung Gana in Kota Marudu. Sumber air ini dikumpulkan di dalam satu mini dam, di mana air itu disalurkan dalam satu pipe bersaiz 4 inci, kemudian disalurkan lagi dalam satu pipe yang bersaiz 2 inci, dan disalurkan ke kawasan perumahan, dan sistem penapisan itu akan dibuat di kawasan perumahan sebelum air ini diagikan kepada rumah masing-masing. These systems will increase portable water supply to more than 2.4 million litres, benefiting over 3,000 villages in these areas. We also empower the communities with the knowledge to maintain these systems. We're pleased to share with you that Soroptimus International will be further complementing our project in Kampung Gana by establishing organic farms coupled with community training to ensure a sustainable form of food and create a possible source of additional income for the local community. Pertama, kami mengharapkan hujan. Itu pun tidak juga mencukupi. Okay, in the interest of time, I'm just jumping forward here. So I must say a very big thank you to Sir Optimist International Malaysia. 
It is a collaboration here which enabled this phase two of the project in East Malaysia. So we went in to, to help the local community set up the water system, educate them how to manage the system, and then Seroptimist went up to take care of the, the food needs by setting up community gardens. And of the five acres of land which they got permit for the, for the local uh, communities to use, two acres have been developed with great success as you can see from the pictures. So thank you, Sir Optimist. A big applause for Renuka. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I now want to invite us to interact with the speakers. We've heard from them. Now it's the time for us as audience to hear from them. And a, a good number of questions have been posed already. So some are specific and some are broad. So I'll just take them as they come. Uh, we have a good theme in the topic about what a, uh, a priority. But do you know who is responsible to protect and watch our water globally so that humanity does not destroy nature? I think that is, someone is posing that. And perhaps uh, Kusum, you could be able to address that. I don't know. How can individuals help to solve the water problem? Again, a very broad uh, a second. question. How, how, does how can individuals individual, okay. help to solve the water problem? What geographical areas would you prioritize for the support? I think that is connected. How can they help? And what? which areas second. would we prioritize? What, what, uh, prioritize? what geographical areas would you prioritize for support in water issues? I think that if you are talking about uh, global... Uh, who is responsible for water globally, I think there are two uh, issues that come to my mind immediately. One is that there are waters which are uh, handled, which are within a country, and there are uh, waters which are international, transnational, where there are water sharing between two, two or even sometimes three or four countries. So uh, all this is being uh, controlled, or I would say, uh, defined by a series of global um, declarations, which to which many of the countries here, I think, have already subscribed. And also, when we take the SDGs, I think most of our countries have signed up to the SDGs. The SDGs bring together a, a, a water management. The water management is not only in, uh, you know, in one goal. It's not only, in, we are not talking five and six when we talk women. We have to talk about health. We have to talk about agriculture. We have to talk of end poverty. So this is why I always say for us, we need to have, if we want to have solutions, we have to have integrated, uh, we need to have integrated uh, perspective. Individuals, I think individuals can do a lot. If I can tell uh, just one small instance, about uh, one and a half years ago, we had a, a garbage dump collapsing and killing many people in Colombo City. After that, many of the citizens of Colombo started sorting out their garbage. They hadn't done it earlier. But when you came into that crisis, people understood that each person as a family, as a mother, as, a, as, as children in schools have a duty to do something for their own uh, society. So if you, I have gone to a Middle Eastern countries which I have been told, you have to take your shower in two minutes. Thank you. I have not taken it in two minutes, but sometimes mm. this is what I should do. Good question. Thank you so much. Another set of questions uh, is about the water technology, and maybe Dr. Rajiv, you will hear this. Someone is asking, does uh, Water Go Global address uh, desertification uh, uh, of boreholes? Watch, how many contacts do you have for assistance with one water project? Not very clear. Then how much is a, is a filter? Uh, thanks, Dr. Rajiv for the principles of your action on what wastewater. I think this is a comment. And then there's another question related to your presentation. Can, Dr. Rajiv, can developing countries manage the cost of the nanotechnology systems? So I think that's about the cost of issues. And somebody here says that, um, doc, dear Dr. Rajiv, I really like what you, you, what you talk. You must have been connected to Vikram Patel. I think this is a contact somebody to see you after the meeting to, to confirm that. Well, I think, I think uh, the issue of cost always comes to someone's mind when you see a technology, when you hear the word nanotechnology, 
I think it creates you know, some sort of phobia that you know, the numbers are just going to be something that's shocking. Our production cost uh, comes up to less than half a US cent per liter of sterile drinking water that's, that's being produced. Now, we have never claimed, and we're not claiming to be you know, the only technology available in this, in, this, in this space, but the problem, I think, has become such a big humanitarian crisis. We are trying to work with everyone and anyone. Um, and I think just to quickly put it to perspective, we've done you know, a very quick uh, analysis. It would cost something like US $6 billion using our technology on an annual basis to actually eradicate water poverty. Now, that sounds like a lot of money, but if you compare this with the US uh, defense budget of $600 billion annually, one year of that defense budget would solve water poverty for the next 100 years. So I think, I think you've got your answer right there when it comes to cost. Thank you so much. The next set of questions is about, uh, perhaps Mariti would uh, jump into this one. Soroptimist partnered with Women for Water Partnership. Is this a path to follow so that Soroptimist can better realize its objectives in gender equality? Then in SDG 6, is water not more a priority than food? Without water, you would not have food. Can we voice this? I think it's a general one on what should be our priority. What are, what are issues of food security? And then, how can Soroptimist clubs better advo advocate for water and food security at government level, social media, more effectively to change minds? Thank you, <clears throat> Thank you very much. Yes, I, uh, starting with the last one, I think... Uh, um, campaigns, media action is something that we easily can do. Uh, if we know something that is not working in our community, in communities where we work, uh, or where we know people, or where we have Strokesmith clubs, I think um, it was earlier it was used that uh, the young women, the young girls are using the media campaigns to get attention. I mean, it got so uh, worldwide known that even all the schools at a certain stage uh, sort of uh, stopped, uh, stopped working for, for a couple of hours in the afternoon. So I think media campaigns are very important. And I think maybe we should listen to the youngsters and do these sort of things as well. Um, of course, uh, uh, we, can, um, we can keep on, I mean, I hope we will keep on working with Women for Water Partnership. And uh, I think the more uh, we work together with other organizations as well, uh, the better our results are. And uh, this is done, uh, Kusum as well. Kusum has just been chosen in the board of Women for Water Bo Partnership again. And uh, so we do work together. And I think having many women organizations joining hands, I think that is uh, one of the, uh, of the best uh, solutions. And again, I think by voicing our needs, our, our, our um, uh, worries, our, um, what, what the, really the women on the ground um, do, I think we can do that at a higher level, like our uh, director of advocacy, we have representatives at the FAO, and then I know that uh, agriculture and water are very much linked, but that is addressed at the FAO by us, and we can do that with our Sir Optimist on the ground. Thank you. Some more here for you. Renuka, I think you could jump into this one. Uh, why do Spark and Water go global, not just get together? They seem to be doing the same thing. I don't know. Perhaps we'll uh, highlight that. And then, uh, should we be creating technology to overcome the water shortage or changing our wasteful habits? What does the panel think is the biggest barrier to change in the way we improve our relationship with... Um, with water, our, we, we, uh, with water and how do we address it? So the first question, we're always looking at uh, good partners. Um, that's been the key of our success to date, finding partners who strategically have the same intent. Um, so 
Yeah, there are always possibilities of working together. Sorry, your second question was? The second question was about um, what is the biggest barrier to change? What does the panel think is the biggest barrier to change in the way, in the way we improve our relationship with water and how do we address it? For us, if I can just, I can just yeah. uh, start on that. For us, the biggest challenge was changing mindset. As I said, it took us a year and a half just to bring together all the stakeholders. So you had uh, local communities who initially were not trusting us and who did not understand that the rivers were actually the source of their drinking water. People just assume you turn on your tap and you get clean supply of water. So that whole pro process of uh, awareness and then educating them and empowering them and also very challenging to bring all the government stakeholders. So now we have um, all different stakeholders sitting around a table together. Mm. So it's a joint action task force being responsible. Good. I think uh, that's, that's crucial. You didn't want to jump into that no, as well? I, I think that, I've, as I always said, this is integration and change is important and making people behave in a different way is so difficult. I think you have found that out in your river training and but uh, this is why I felt that you know before you do a project we need to spend a lot of time understanding the community, understanding the context and very often in the development world we don't, we are not given that space. So we have to rush into solutions which may not be the best solution. Right. I think as we approach the closing uh, I would just want you to do one quick uh, final thought, Dr. Rajiv. Are you in partnership with Salvatan, the enterprise that invented solar safe water systems? If not, what would be the benefits? Well, um, you know, at the moment, I think, like, like I said, we are open to partnering and working with various different in the, you know, groups uh, you know, in the same water space because we don't look at other groups as you know, being competitors to us. We want to work with as many people as possible, you know, share our technology, you know, work with other technologies, because the problem that we have in hand, I think, is, is one that is just absolutely, um, you know, it's, it's huge. Great. Then we could take just a 30 seconds parting shot from each speaker, starting with Kusu. No, I'm still wired, I believe. Oh, you're wired. <laughs> yeah, I think that uh, working... For us, we are all facing challenges where we have to move away from the contentions to consensus building. Consensus building is going to be very important because we are, the, the issues are piling up so fast that we really cannot have time to co cope up with it. The second is that, you know, we are talking about young people and older people. This intergenerational equity is very important for me. We have to hand back the world as whole as it can be. And that, that is what the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the greater Thunbergs of the world are telling us, you know, that we have not really done what we should. And the third one is that, you know, we need to have a, a set of professionals who are able to deal with gender. Because so you, as you may think that this is a, a long time uh, coming, but we still do not teach gender how to work with gender and water, for instance, in our university systems to the extent which is uh, possible. So if you do not create this set of professionals who are gender sensitive and gender savvy, uh, then we are going to have problems in development. Thank you. Renuka, your parting shot, 30 seconds. 30 seconds, all right. For me, um, the great lesson in Malaysia has been that uh, government has spent millions trying to clean up rivers, and this investment has failed because they've failed to change the mindset to engage local communities to actually understand their needs and find out how to work with them, empower them with the skills, and then they will take ownership. Thank you. Dr. Rajiv, what's well, your parting shot to well, the I audience? Think, I, think, I think the most important thing is, you know, I just feel that the crisis, you know, uh, the water poverty crisis is just not getting the traction. It's not selling. You know, um, 10,000 lives have been lost today. 10,000 lives are going to be lost tomorrow. Um, and I, I, I honestly feel and I think and I believe that every single one of us in this room here today can play a role, you know, an active role in, in, in helping, you know, create awareness, you know, looking for solutions to the problem that we have um, in, in hand. Thank you. Marit? Uh, I, I agree with, with all of you, of course. And 
I think awareness is not enough. I think it's about time that we take action. Uh, the, the problem is huge and affects every single one of us. And it affects, I mean, we can say we, it affects women more than, than men. That is a true fact. But it affects also um, uh, economic empowerment. It uh, affects uh, the world population uh, migrating. Uh, it affects the climate change, this water. So water is so uh, related to everything that's happening on this earth that I think we have to be very aware of it and we have to play our part as women and not only create awareness but really start taking action. Thank you so much. I think with this, all speakers are, are they not, uh, fantastic. Let's give a big applause to all of them. And... As we close the day, I think we go home with a few words from them. Integration, public-private partnerships, individual um, taking action, including two minutes in the shower. So don't do a bubble bath. <laughs> All right? I can manage and, five and that minutes the now. Technology is the other aspect that we're going home with, that there's uh, good technology that, that can help us get water uh, access to everyone. And of course, sort optimists are all over the world. All these problems are facing women and girls globally. We have to take action now. Not just awareness, real action, and we partner with our government and everyone else out there. So thank you so much. My time is up as your moderator, but you never gave me enough problems. I'm glad that you are all very good speakers. <laughs> the audience as well. Thank you for the many questions that you put forward. Have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Mary. That's very Thank you, nice. Mary, for getting the best out of our panel. And now I have the pleasure to invite Mrs. Yvonne Simpson, our immediate past president of Optimus International, to give away our gifts of appreciation to our esteemed uh, speaker and uh, moderator. Thank you. Yes, I want to talk with you on that. On? I want to talk about what is Apple Focus. What is yes. it? First gift to um, Kusum. <laughs> yeah. To enter Renuka. The President Marit. wonderful moderator. Let's give her a big hand. Ladies, a round of applause for our wonderful plenary session, especially to our wonderful moderator, Mary Moyer.